ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय खालकृत मन ये यदा प्रिय सफालो ये लोक वायुर्वा घन्नावली खालकृत मन ये सफालो ये लोक वायोर इवा कन्नावली खालकृत मन ये शायद अप्रिय सफालो ये लोक वायोर इवा कन्नावली done by inevitable time done by inevitable time manye manye i think i think bhavatham cha bhavatham cha for you also for you also yat yat whatever whatever apriyam apriyam detestable Sapala, Sapala, with the rulers, rulers. yet Bashe, under the control of that time, of that time. Loka, Loka, everyone in every planet, everyone in every planet, Vayo, Vayo, 
the wind carries, the wind. Eva, Eva as, as. Ganavali, Ganavali, a line of clouds. In my opinion, this is all due to inevitable time, under whose control everyone in every planet is carried, just as the clouds are carried by the wind. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. There is control by time all over the space within the universe. As there is control by time all over the planets, all the big gigantic planets, including the sun, are being controlled by the force of air as the clouds are carried by the force of air. Similarly, the inevitable kala or time controls even the action of the air and other elements. Everything, therefore, is controlled by the Supreme Kala, a forceful representative of the Lord within the material world. Thus, Yudhisthira should not be sorry for the inconceivable action of time. Everyone has to bear the actions and reactions of time as long as one is within the conditions of the material world. Yudhisthira should not think that he had committed sins in his previous birth and is suffering the consequence. Even the most pious has to suffer the condition of material nature. But a pious man is faithful to the Lord, for he is guided by the bona fide Brahman and Vaishnav following the religious principles. These three guiding principles should be the aim of life. One should not be disturbed by the tricks of eternal time. Even the great controller of the universe, Brahmaji, is also under the control of that time. Therefore, one should not grudge being thus controlled by time despite being a true follower of religious principles. Om Timidandasya Kyananjana Chalakaya Chakshuru Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Tatati Swapadantikam Pandeham Sri Guru Sri Chutapatakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavanscha Sri Rupam Sagra Jata Sahakana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Padijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padahan Sahakana Dalita Sri Vishakan Bitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Brinda Baneshwadi Vrishabhanu Sate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patithanam Bhavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya 
प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैता गदाधर श्री वासदी गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे In my opinion this is all due to inevitable time under whose control everyone and every planet is carried just as the clouds are carried by the wind We are reading today from Shrimad Bhagavatam canto 1 chapter 9 entitled the passing away of bhishma dev i am very grateful to be with all of you again shri radha gopinath temple thank you for coming Bhishma one of the great mahajans mahajan means the highest authorities in understanding the truth who by their words and their lives exemplify personify the way in which we should live within this world and the way we see we see god we see ourselves we see others and also how we see the workings of material nature bhagavad gita explains these five truths ishwara the supreme control of the origin of everything that exists in the west he is called god ishwara the sanskrit word describes the supreme controller of all controllers Ishwara Parama Krishna Satchit Ananda Vikra Anadira Dir Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam Lord Brahma who is also a Mahajan the original guru of a, of each universe is explaining Ishwara Ishwara Parama Krishna <coughs> Krishna who is the source of everything is the cause of all causes his form his past times his holy names his abode are such at ananda eternal full of knowledge full of bliss this sat or eternal feature of the lord is very important to understand the second element is the jiva or the living entity who is mamayavam so jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana eternally part and parcel of krishna Shri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his teachings that are recorded in our scriptures his most exhaustive and elaborate teachings were spoken to Shri Sanatan Goswami in Varanasi for 2 months he spoke 
throughout the day, every day. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami summarized it in many chapters of Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita. And he built all of his teachings on a simple foundation. The very basis of the beginning of all knowledge, according to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, is Jivara Swarupoy Krishnera Nitya Das. That the living entity is by nature an eternal servant of Krishna. This eternality is so important for us to understand. That the living being, every living being, the jiva is eternal. Satchit ananda. But when the living entity, when the spirit soul, by free will, chooses rather than to serve the Lord, which is our constitutional nature, when we want to separately enjoy, and we come under the influence of prakriti, the third principle that Krishna teaches in the Gita. What is prakriti? Scriptures and the Acharyas teach us that the Lord primarily has three energies. There is the um, Antaranga Shakti, the Jiva Shakti, the Bahiranga Shakti. The um, spiritual energy of the Lord, where everything is in truth understood as Satchit Ananda. Where there is, in the spiritual energy, everything is fully conscious, fully realized of the truth of themselves, of God, and of every other living being. The spiritual energy there is the Brahma Jyoti, the eternal effulgence of the Lord. And within the spiritual energy, there are innumerable Vaikuntha planets. It's quite inconceivable to understand. To try to understand God with our own intelligence is impossible. Who is God? Material nature is just an insignificant aspect of God, of Ishwara, Krishna. This one little tiny earth planet is but a speck of the universe. There are so many planets within this universe. We look in the stars in the sky it's baffling how many, and that's just what we are seeing lit up. There are innumerable planets in the universe, and there are innumerable universes in the cosmic manifestation. Innumerable means they can't even be counted. They're not, they're not just in the hundreds or the thousands or the millions or the billions. There are innumerable universes within this cosmic manifestation. And beyond the cosmic manifestation with the, the Brahma Jyoti, there are innumerably more Vaikuntha planets. The impersonal philosophers, their goal of liberation is to enter into the Brahma Jyoti, into that absolutely pure spiritual energy of the Lord, where there is no suffering, there is no birth, there is no death, there is no ignorance. There's just pure existence. And the devotees, their desire is to enter into the Vaikuntha, 
the abodes of the Lord, where the Lord is eternally existing in one of his unlimited manifested forms to enjoy pastimes or lila with all of us. Some impersonal or mayavad philosophers, they challenge. What is this about an eternal abode of the Lord? What do you do there? How can all little living beings be there? And what do you, what do you do? Just look at Vishnu all day? But this is trying to understand Vaikuntha in the same way we try to understand material nature. Krishna is inconceivable. Krishna is unlimited. God is one. But how incredible that one God expands in every Vaikuntha planet as a unique transcendental personality. And he's still the same, one person. And there are innumerable Vaikuntha planets. Well, he's Narayan, Ram, Narasimha, Vamana. And there are innumerable devotees in each Vaikuntha planet because the Vaikuntha planets are massive. They're unlimited in size. This is Krishna. And each one of us, we are eternal. And we have a choice, either to participate in the eternal pastimes of the Lord in the spiritual realm, or to come into prakriti, or the material existence. In the material existence, everything is ultimately controlled by time. And what does that mean when we hear that everything is controlled by time? That means everything except the soul itself. The soul is imperishable. Krishna tells us in the Gita, Nahanyate Hanyamane Sadide. The soul cannot be burnt by fire, moistened by water, cannot be touched by any weapon. How incredible, any weapon. In days of past, the weapons were clubs and bows and arrows. And later, bullets and guns and machine guns. And now, then there were bombs, atomic bombs. Now there are nuclear bombs. And scientists are ever working overtime to somehow or other create more subtle and more powerful bombs. But it's a weapon. And Krishna says no weapon can even touch the soul. Can't even put a little scar. If an atomic bomb drops right on somebody's head. <laughs> Nuclear bomb. A bomb that has the power to destroy an entire country. If they ever make such a bomb. If it, if it lands right on your head, ground zero. <laughs> it cannot even put the slightest little cut on the soul. Because the soul is of a different nature. It's transcendental. It's eternal. It's not, it doesn't die when the body dies. But this material body, because it's under the influence of time, which is the fourth factor within Bhagavad Gita's teachings, everything inevitably is destroyed. Therefore, the scripture tells us the material existence is Marcha Loka. It's a planet of death. Abrama bhuvana loka punar avartan orjana mamu bhejitu kunteya punar janmana vidyate. 
from the highest planet of Brahmaloka down to the lowest Patala. Still, everything is controlled by time, which means everything is destined to be destroyed. Apare Amitashtvanyam. Krishna explains material existence in this way. Bhumir apo nalo vayu kamanaur budrevacha ahankara ithiyame bina prakriti rashtita. The nature of prakriti is it is always changing. There's nothing stable within material existence. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. All physical elements are composed of these five basic elements and the various combinations. And then there is the mind, the intelligence, and the ego. These things can be tremendously affected by physical circumstances, but they cannot be destroyed by material circumstances. But ever-changing. Every cell in the body is constantly changing. Every atomic particle is changing. This is the influence of time. And the next factor of the Gita is karma, the law of actions and reactions. The Gita teaches there's karma a karma vi karma. Karma is proper action according to the codes of morality. Vi karma, the karma, the reaction of good karma is we get pleasant, favorable results. Vikarma means sinful acts, where we get unfavorable, painful reactions, suffering. And then there is akarma. It gets no material reaction. That means our actions are engaged in the loving service of the Lord. So how, within this material existence, Bhishma is explaining that the Pandavas, they didn't do vikarma. They didn't even do karma. They were doing akarma. They were great devotees of the Lord, especially Yudhisthira Maharaj. It's really incredible, Maharaj Yudhisthira up until Krishna tricked him and forced him, he never said a lie in his life. And even then, he kind of didn't even do it. How many of you have never spoken a lie in your life? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. <laughs> but think about it. How controlled was you to steer? He never spoke a lie. He never did anything that was deliberately immoral. You know, you may say, why did he gamble? When? But according to the, he was a kshatriya, and he was being challenged to do so. And according to the kshatriya um, codes of honor, you cannot refuse a challenge. That was again, you know, his stature. You know, from a one perspective, he never should have done it. But from another perspective, it was his duty. And he was so pious that previous to his coming to meet Bhishma, the reason Krishna brought him to meet Bhishma, he was such a devotee, he was so humble. 
that he took the responsibility for all the bloodshed and death of the Battle of Kurukshetra. He was willing to take the full responsibility. He was willing to say it was all my fault. And that's what he was saying, even though none of it was his fault. He was taking the blame for what he didn't do. It was all Duryodhana and Dhritarashtra's fault. They were personifications of Vikarama. And here, Yudhisthira Maharaj is telling Krishna and others that all these innocent ladies are widows because of me. All these little children are fatherless because of me. All these warriors are dead or wounded because of me, just so that I could become the king. Such a devotee. He felt every, live, every one of his citizens was his own child. That's how he loved everyone. That's how he ruled the world, by Krishna's grace. He was willing to give his life for an insect. We see his son, his, his nephew, Parikshit, who was trained by Yudhisthira Maharaj, when he became king, how he was traveling around the whole world to make sure even the most innocent, helpless creatures were protected. Such a person. Yudhisthira was so pious, he was so pure, he was so devoted that Krishna himself used to bow to him. Krishna considered like an, an elder cousin brother. Arjuna was like an equal peer to Krishna. But Yudhisthira Maharaj, Krishna accepted as a, as a superior. Krishna ran messages for Yudhisthira, like his messenger. He was Arjuna's charioteer and he was Krishna's, he was Yudhisthira's messenger, taking words to your Duryodhana and others, words of truth, words of wisdom. So Bhishma here is, is seeing Yudhisthira standing before him as he's laying in a bed of arrows. Bhishma was a Mahajan. He actually was looking forward to death because he understood how this world works. There are so many atrocities, even to good people. So this is something that, you just, that Bhishma Dev is expressing to us. Yudhisthira didn't do any V karma. He didn't do any bad karma, nor did Kunti. And whatever mistakes they may have made, it was never with animosity or enmity with, for others. This is where real bad karma is when we have enmity in our heart, when we want to cause pain or hurt others. Yudhisthira never had that. So why? Why Kunti and the Pandavas had to suffer so bad? First their father died. Then they were under the custody of Dhritarashtra and Duryodhana, his son, and they hated them. From their childhood, they wanted them exterminated because they saw them a threat to their own rule. This was Duryodhana's mentality. He was so deeply envious. And why is it in this world that envious, wicked people sometimes win over, or for some time, the pious? Ravana stole Sita, and he had her for almost a full year. 
Vedavati. How is that? And the Pandavas were banished for 12 years. The house of lack. They were fed poison, humiliated. And here Bhishma is looking at Yudhisthira. How did it happen to you? You didn't deserve any of this. And your own sons were killed. They were great devotees. Abhimanu was a very, very dear to Krishna. Krishna loved Abhimanu. All the Pandavas loved Abhimanu. He wasn't a wicked, sinful person. Why did he have to die? And the five sons of Draupadi, the son of Yudhisthira, Bhima, Arjuna, Nakula, Sahadev, she had a son for me for each of them. And they were all mercil mercilessly murdered in their sleep. They didn't even have a chance to fight. Aswatthama massacred them. Why? Krishna loved them. The Pandavas loved them. Why is, how is this happening? And the suffering of Subhadra. Interesting, Subhadra is the Yogamaya, the spiritual potency of the Lord. Yet when Abhimanu was killed, her own son, she was weeping excessively. And Arjuna, his father, was deeply affected. Bhima is asking, how could this happen? And then he's giving the answer. In the future verse, verses, he tells, even the greatest philosophers, the greatest sages, the greatest rishis cannot understand exactly how things happen and why within this material nature. Because the power of time Time is the manifestation of Krishna within creation. And how is it? Why is it called the manifestation of Krishna? Because within material existence, time is the Ishwara. Time is controlling everything. Nothing, no one can escape for a moment. Just think about time, how inconceivable. It's an energy. If we think about it that way, growing old is blissful. <laughs> We're being molded by Krishna's energy. And everything. The sun is rising by the power of time and it is setting. The moon is waxing and waning. The seasons are coming and going. And with every moment, everything is ultimately being destroyed. Is that bad? Is that destruction bad? It's natural. This beautiful garland of Brindaban Kali Kadamba flowers that I have been given, they are so nectarine and fragrant. Everyone has their personalities and their natures. And some people like roses and some people like jasmine. But personally, the most sweet fragrance in all of creation that I have found is the Brindaban Kadamba flower. <laughs> the Bengali Kadamba flowers are very beautiful but I have not seen such fragrance. It's incredible. I'm too much attached to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Mahaprasad, so... 
dovetailing my attachments. <laughs> but even this most sweet, ambrosial, intoxicating, <laughs> unbelievable, <laughs> indescribable, Kadamba of Kadamba flower fragrance. In a day or so, it's going to just shrivel up and have no fragrance. Isn't that wonderful? And then a new Kadamba flower will grow. In the spiritual world, Kadamba flowers are eternal. In the spiritual world, a Kadamba garland like this, its fragrance increases day by day, year by year, millennium by millennium, <coughs> forever, ever increasing. That is the difference between material nature and spiritual nature. Because in the spiritual world, this, the destructive debilitating nature of time doesn't exist. Rather, time exists in the spiritual world in a completely opposite way. Everything is ever increasing in beauty and sweetness and love because that's the way Krishna is. It's not time, it's something very different. If the great Mahajan Bhishma, on behalf of all the great Mahajans, Brahma, Shiva, Narada, Kapila, Shukadev, Yamaraj, Swayambhumanu, all of these and more of these greatest of sages, they cannot understand the inconceivable workings within material existence. Dukalayama Shashvata. Everything is temporary. You see, we are taught when we come to Krishna consciousness, we're not taught that by developing love for Krishna, by hearing his glories, chanting his names, associating with his devotees, that material nature changes. Material nature is material nature. It's working in inconceivable ways. There are the laws of karma, which we try to follow. But the laws of karma are limited. They affect happiness and distress in this life. They affect our next life, what kind of life we're going to take, whether it's a lower species, like a rat, or a cat, or this, or that, whatever it may be. Could be a fish, a chopetti. <laughs> little fishermen that go out with their nets. There's so many varieties of life, and that's all due to karma. But whatever our karma may be, however pious we are, we have to suffer. That's material existence. That is why when Krishna comes to this world, yada, yada, hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata, again and again and again, he's telling us, no matter how pious you are, no matter how good you are, you have to suffer. That's material existence, because everything is under the control of time. You have to grow old, you have to get diseased, you have to die. And Govinda Das was a very, very pure, pious devotee, a personal associate of Nityananda Prabhu and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Narottam Das Thakur. 
he wrote this beautiful prayer. E dana yojana putra parijana ite ki ache padati tire Kamala dala jala jivana talamala Bajahun hari padani tire It's in every scripture. It's a predominant theme of the Gita, of the Bhagavatam. And he's expressing it all in such a poetic way that everything within this material creation, everything, our body, our life, all of our relatives, all of our possessions, all of our skills that we work so hard for, everything, it's all like a drop of water on a leaf of a lotus. Material existence is like a leaf of a lotus and everything material is like the, the drops of water. At any moment, it slips away. That's the nature of this world. Bajahun hari padani today. Therefore we worship Lord Hari. So important. Because although everything in this world is uncertain, padam padam yad vipadam natesham. This means whether we're pious or impious, whether we're pure devotees, neophyte devotees, or atheists. There's danger at every step in this world. What's the difference between a non-devotee and a devotee? In that same situation where there's danger at every step, where suffering or death could come at any moment for anyone, whoever we are, especially in this fragile earth planet, in Kali Yuga, in Satya Yuga there was a little more certainty about things. But Kali Yuga is an age where things go wild. There's so little certainty. Kalero dosani de rajana stehe kamahanguna. Kali Yuga is an ocean of faults. But there's one benediction that simply chanting the names of Lord Hari Krishna we can attain supreme liberation. So this padam padam yadvi padam natesham, for a devotee, we understand, we, we're, we're seeking the realization of the eternal soul. And the dangers of material existence are actually an impetus to help us take shelter of Krishna, to take our spiritual lives very seriously. And although everything is uncertain within material existence, there is one thing that is absolutely 100% certain. That Krishna is always there to reciprocate with the love of his devotee. At whatever level of Krishna consciousness we're on, Krishna is there for us. And when Krishna tells that he's there for us, he's talking about our eternal souls. Whatever may happen in this material existence, Krishna will be there. In life and in death. Yam yam vapi smaran bhavam tijatyante kalevaram. Krishna says, one who, according to what we remember at the time of death, we will attain. Those who are sincere to remember Krishna, to serve Krishna, to please Krishna in life, we know that Krishna is going to be with them in life and in whatever situation happens. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains there are different ways of dying in this world. There are auspicious ways and inauspicious ways. 
but the auspicious and inauspicious is for people who are of karma kanda. But for a devotee, these things are irrelevant. It doesn't matter how it happens, when it happens, or where it happens. For a devotee, Krishna is always there. For a devotee, life and death are all auspicious. All auspicious doesn't mean that the body is in a pleasing situation. All auspicious means that the soul is being connected with Krishna. The soul is being blessed with its eternal nature once again, is being uplifted. Krishna promises, Srila Prabhupada promised us that if we're just sincere about our Krishna consciousness, then Krishna will be there in our life. Krishna will be there in our inevitable death. So therefore, when sincere, loving devotees or even those who are near and dear to sincere and loving devotees. We should know when they pass from this world, from a spiritual perspective, it's a glorious celebration because Krishna's there, Krishna's with them. The eternality of time it doesn't really make much difference whether we live two years or 200 years. Time is like that. My father, who many of you know, he's 88. And he tells me, he, he has a very clear memory by, by the Lord's grace. He has good memory. He remembers things, and he talks about things he did when he was four or five years old. He likes to tell stories about his when he was a <laughs> little boy and the trouble he used to get into, different religious ceremonies he was in. He, he has one of my uncles, is his age, only six months younger. And every Wednesday they meet and have lunch together. And sometimes I join them when I'm there and they just talk about those days when they were little children together. And they just can't, they just look at their bodies like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like a minute ago I was a little child and now look at this. It's quite incredible watching them talk together. Because when they talk about their teenage years and their childhood years, it was like it was a few minutes ago. And that's what it feels like to them. How did 88 years pass like this? They can't believe they have these old bodies and all the stuff going wrong. And did they do anything wrong to get old bodies? Everybody gets old, yes. Sometimes people think that that's a great accomplishment in life, to live long enough to get old. That that's something very great. But it's only a few seconds. From a, perspective, from a higher perspective of time. Shukadeva Goswami says, better one moment of full consciousness, one moment of love for Krishna, devotion to Krishna, better one moment of just desiring to please Krishna with all our heart, than to live for hundreds and hundreds of years. There are trees. That one tree, 
the Norwegian spruce tree in Sweden, 9,500 years. Same jiva. One little jivatma has been in that tree for 9,500 years. And it's really cold there, Sweden, in the winter. Hare Krishna. But from a demigod's perspective, it's like a few seconds. For our, from our perspective, it's a long time. Prahlad was only five. Dhruva was only five when they realized Krishna. So yes, sometimes, you know, we think, why does Krishna do this to people? It's not like that. Material nature, time, Krishna's the ultimate controller of time. But Krishna's not necessarily directly involved in the workings of Prakriti. Time is working in very inconceivable ways, and we have our free will. If we choose to do something in a certain way, then something may happen. Where does Krishna come in? Krishna comes in not necessarily in the actions and reactions of material existence. Krishna is there to reciprocate with our atma, with our soul. When we offer a flower to the deity, Krishna accepts it. When we offer our sincere sincerity as we're chanting his holy name, Krishna's accepting it. And what's happening? The ignorance of the ego is being removed. The attachment to the body is being removed. The attachment to the things of the world is being removed. And the attachment to Krishna is awakening. And the attachment to the souls of every living being is being awakened. And therefore, in life or death, anyone who turns to Krishna, Krishna is there. And that is all auspicious. That is beautiful. That is wonderful. And this was Bhishma's realization in this particular verse. This is all due to inevitable time, under whose control everyone and every planet is carried just as the clouds are carried by the wind. When Lord Chaitanya was just a small boy, suddenly his father got a fever and died. Happened really quick. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was Nimai. He was weeping and crying over the death of his father. Because that's how things there are. We, we should weep and cry when the body of a dear one is gone. But those tears should be offerings of our gratitude and love. Those tears should be offerings of prayer for our beloved ones. They shouldn't be tears that are simply leaving us in a void of depression. Because the Atma is with Krishna for a devotee. The Atma is with Krishna for anyone dear to a devotee. That's Krishna's infinite love, Krishna's infinite compassion. He will never let any devotee's Atma be lost if they turn to him with sincere devotion. 
And we have so many beautiful stories in that regard. Srivas, his son died, and Lord Chaitanya brought him to life, and he instructed the whole world through his words that I am the eternal soul. These bodies are coming and going and coming and going and coming and going. And how they come and how they go, that's a great mystery. But one thing is for sure, my Lord, those who chant your names with sincere devotion will come to you. Is there any questions? Yes. Thank you, Maharaj, for this enlightening talk. Maharaj, in the first hint of the Bhagavatam, the description of King Yudhishthir leaving home after he got the news that Lord Krishna has left the planet. So, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada explains that the uh, last 15 to 20 years of one's life should be totally dedicated to uh, complete Krishna consciousness, preparing for the next life. So, how do, we, how do we understand in practice, like, of course we are practicing Krishna Consciousness, but uh, since we really don't know in the last 15 to 20 years, and what does it mean in a practical sense for different devotees in different ashrams? Prahlad has taught us, Komara Achade Pragyo Dharaman Bhagavataniya. <coughs> that we should cultivate devotion to Krishna immediately, even in the youngest time. Because Prahlad explains, we don't know when we're old. Old means close to death, and death could come to anyone at any moment. It's the nature of the world. So therefore, he's telling children, this is the time that you should become serious. In the natural course of events, we perform our duties in this world in a devotional spirit. But when we become older, we're, this is specifically talking about one who goes through Grihasta Ashram. Brahmacharis are already like that. But for a Grihasta, when the children are raised, we, sh we could. We should be a pure devotee while we're raising our children. We should be a pure devotee. We should be striving for pure devotion at every stage of life. Krishna tells Arjuna, you cannot give up your duties. But when our duties are complete and our children can take over everything, at that time, what do we do? Go fishing? <laughs> Watch television. <laughs> that time we should, we, we, it's very clear that we're going to die very soon. You know, at any time of life, padam padam yadvi padam natasham, it may happen. But when you get old, you know it will happen, 100%, very soon. So old age is nice like that. It's a good warning signal to really immerse ourselves very, very seriously. But we should re immerse ourselves at every age as seriously as possible. Ramananda Rai said there is no greater pain than to lose the association of devotees. So we should know that when devotees leave us, it should severely pain our hearts because their bodies were the sacred medium in which we could connect and relate to their souls. So their bodies, although temporary, under the control of time, still, they were instruments, they were vehicles in which these precious souls 
were communicating with us and communicating with Krishna in this world. So for devotees, the body is something very, very sacred. And when a devotee leaves this world, it is a very painful thing. Separation from Vaishnavas should deeply affect our hearts. But that effect should not be with confusion, should not be in bewilderment, should not be why. Why? We may never know. But we do know Krishna is there for them. That's his promise. That is the absolute truth that Krishna will be there for his devotee. We're not bewildered about that. We're not confused about that. The pain is for us, for the world. The world is losing that association. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Srila Prabhupada's mission is, is, is losing such precious, precious, invaluable personality. and our own hearts, those who inspire us, those who we love, those who love us, to lose such a person, it's painful. But that pain should be an offering of love to their eternal souls. That pain should be an offering of gratitude to their eternal souls. That pain should be an offering of sincere prayers to Krishna for that eternal soul. And that pain should also be an expression of our gratitude to Krishna. Like little Stoka Krishna, he was dying and smiling the whole time. From the time he got the notice to the moment he died, there was a smile on his face because he was so grateful. How many Bhagavatam classes I, how many times I chanted the holy names, how many times I, I got the blessings of Vaishnavas, how many times I had the opportunity to do some service. What a blessing in this life. Anybody in this age of Kali who engages in devotional service, their life is so auspicious. And for sincere devotees, we know that Krishna, who is the ultimate supreme embodiment of gratitude, remembers every good thing we've ever done. and will be there for us. So our pain should be, our, our tears should be offered in that spirit. Yes, Govinda Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj, for nice class. Maharaj, this is the question about uh, when we see, especially our devotee community, when they are practicing their Krishna consciousness, if they practice too seriously, we hear sometime in their later years, they say, oh, I was too Krishna conscious, therefore I was not able to do many other things. And on the other hand, sometime, if they are given that freedom to be involved in the material world, they may not even come back to Krishna. So there is always this difficulty that complaining about practicing too much and if you give them loose, if they get into material life and they may not even come back to Krishna and we don't know what happens, when, what happens. So how do you balance where they take to Krishna consciousness with their own conviction and how do you facilitate that thing for them to 
practice with a real heart. To be honest with you, I'm so intoxicated by the fragrance of these <laughs> kadamba flowers that I couldn't focus on your question. <laughs> Could you make it brief? <laughs> Maybe I should put this garland on you as you're asking the question. <laughs> but I'm too attached to give it to you. <laughs> Especially asking about the children, Maharaj, where they, they're living in the world which is full of you know, sense gratification, which makes them, oh, this is the real world. And if the parents, the devotees tell them, oh, this is temporary, you know, it's nothing there. But there is no facility for them to practice that, that detachment. What they're there, they're only in the, the, the glittering world. So if you take them away from there, they'll go back. If you take them away from there, anyway, they'll go, go there and try to enjoy. And if they enjoy, they may not come back to Krishna. So, how do you deal with this? Just give them Kadamba. <laughs> this is symbolic. If you give them higher taste, then they will uh, understand. <coughs> Bhakti? <coughs> Bhakti is practiced with intelligence and balance. <coughs> Srila Prabhupada, he tells when he was a little boy, he wanted a toy gun. Yes? And he cried and cried and cried for his father to get him the toy gun. And Govinda, you still have the microphone, right? So what did his father do? Now, before you speak, Gaur Mohande was a pure devotee of Krishna. Every morning, little Abai would wake up seeing his father and mother worshipping Radha Govinda. The mother was cooking for Radha Govinda, the father was doing puja for Radha Govinda, and then he would go to, he would chant on his mala every day, and then he would go to work. His father worked, he had this cloth merchant or whatever he was doing, and he would come home from work, and his mother would have prasad for the sadhus. So this is, you know, the atmosphere, and in all of that, Srila Prabhupada wanted, or little Abhai wanted a toy gun, and he was crying for a toy gun. And what did his father do? He bought one. He bought him a toy gun. And then he and said he wants a second one. <laughs> <laughs> then Abai was crying for a second one. And what does his father do? Bought him the second one also. Hare Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> so children need to play and they need things to play and we should facilitate that. But we should create a Krishna conscious environment around it. If we just take it all away from them, then they feel, they'll, they may grow up feeling deprived that they never really had a childhood. So we have, they, they should have the facility to have fun and play and all of that, but the parents create a Krishna conscious environment around it all. You can give them their toy gun, but let them wake up seeing the arty. Uh, <laughs> and let them see their parents serving the sadhus. So that we have to balance like that. We can't deprive our children. We have to let them have their facilities within material enjoyment, but we, we keep that Kadamba garland around their neck, is, <laughs> which means we keep that environment around them of devotion. And if we, even if we give them these material things in a spirit of devotion, then they will feel Krishna's love even when we give them these things. Yes? You see, things are, are facilities to express love. So 
So even when Gore Mohan Day gave little Abai a toy gun, obviously he was giving it as, in, in, to, okay, you want it, it's Maya and all this stuff, but <laughs> in one sense it's not. If you offer it with love and devotion to, 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 to Krishna, if you offer it with that love of Krishna in your heart to your child, then even that apparent material thing actually has a spiritual energy. Yes? That's the environment that is required. Where the parents really, they're doing it for Krishna. And that energy, if we just do it because the child's a disturbance, okay, here, you know, get out of my way. It's not going to have the same energy. It's okay, you want to play, you're a child. Here's, a, here's some gun prasad. <laughs> I'm giving this to you so that you could be happy, so that you could love Krishna. Yes? And that's what happened. So being a parent means to be balanced. We have to be patient. What you're saying is true. We have seen that when parents are too strict, children rebel and they really get into material life because it's like they want to see what it is. They've been, they feel deprived. Some children don't want it so much. They just like to do RTs and all that. From what I see is usually little boys, they like to be Hanuman, and then they like to be Ram, and then they like to be, um, who's next? <laughs> Bhima. And then they get a little older and they want to be materialistic. <laughs> yes, and little girls. It's natural. People want to explore material energy. We can't deprive our children of that. But we want to surround them with the higher taste and discipline them in, in areas that become dangerous. But too much discipline can backfire. The Kadamba garland means keep, surround them with an atmosphere of bhakti and let their plays be within, within the circle of that garland. Does that make, answer your question? Yes. Any other question? Yes, Radhe Shyam Prabhu. Hare Krishna. All the Mahajans are asking questions. <laughs> Krishna Nanda Govinda Radhe Shyam. Uh, thank you very much for such a beautiful answer to Govind Prabhu's question, Maharaj. Uh, I have a question in, in connection to Govind Prabhu's question. Uh, it is well known that the Vedic literature don't deprive us of enjoyment, but they only deprive us of that enjoyment which will implicate us in suffering now and subsequently in cycle of birth and death, you know, in the lives to come. So they certainly allow us enlightened enjoyment. Can you speak slower and... Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I was telling that the Vedas don't deprive us of enjoyment, but they deprive us of that enjoyment which will cause suffering to us. In order to ultimately benefit us, they restrict us from certain types of enjoyments. So in the same manner as you rightly said, the Gan Prasad and other things for the children you said, it's very nice. Uh, but we find, Maharaj, that the children, or even the, uh, we can say, grown-up children, you know, even they always want that which is poisonous, you know, that which will implicate them in suffering now and in the time to come. Uh, for example, uh, the modern-day teenagers now, 
you know, they watch so much of Hollywood, Bollywood and all these things. And because of which, even after they come to the realm of devotional service, you know, they speak sentences in double meaning, you know, this kind of things and also uh, the way they, they are dealing with one another, even after becoming a devotee, the, the impurity that they bring from the outside world is so much that their devotion service leave alone uh, being pure, even it's not even average, it is below average. So they may externally wear the dress of a devotee, they may externally wear the dress of a devotee when they come to temple, but even uh, they poison the devotion service also by bringing some stuff from the other side. So, when I heard you, I was very pleased to hear the understanding of how we should not be too restrictive with children. We should not be too restrictive, but we should be giving it in a way that enhances their Krishna consciousness. But we find the material enjoyment uh, is so intoxicating that it pollutes even devotional service. So, uh, in such a situation, Maharaj, like Govind Prabhu was asking now, I had a similar question also like him. So what is your question? <laughs> you have given a thorough analysis of material energy, but what is your question? One of the question is, the, when Prabhupada is a small boy, desired a toy gun, it wasn't that harmful. You know, he can have two toy gun for each hand, you know. But the children desire that which will implicate them in suffering. Like, like for example, yeah, teenage boy, you know, wanting to roam with a teenage girl, you know, he may, it may be very thrilling for him, but causes great tension to parents, you know, because it may implicate the whole family and his life in such a complicated uh, mesh in future, you know. Uh, so how can uh, the, the freedom, uh, because there are certain things in which freedom could be given and certain things in which freedom cannot be given. That's why, uh, is, is there not a clear-cut demarcation line, Maharaj? <laughs> if Radhe Shyam Prabhu had children, He would, he would raise them in Badrigasha. <laughs> not, not the lower one. The, the higher one where the Vyas lives. Because at the lower one there is too much facility for material enjoyment. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Ultimately, we should create that environment of pure devotional service around our children. And when they're little children, we, we should really, whatever material things we give them, or material, we try to connect it to Krishna. Even the games could be connected to Krishna. Even the toys could be connected to Krishna. Even the dolls can be connected to Krishna. So we try to give them a happy life. We don't want our children, children are not meant to, to be unhappy. We try to give them happiness in Krishna. We connect it to Krishna. But once they start getting older, as you say, then they're going to do what you, they want, whatever you say. Yes? That's part of life. That's kind of what you did, becoming a devotee. You know, we have our free will. Srila Prabhupada explains, when children are very young, we have to, in a very loving way, in a very positive way, discipline them. That means we give them so much love and affection, and we give them so much encouragement, and we, 
and we give them so much appreciation for the good things they do that when we do discipline them, they don't get depressed by it. They can actually understand it deep down as an act of our love and concern for them. That's important. But then when they grow older, we have to be their friend because we can't really discipline them anymore, especially in this modern age. But even if they get in, even if they get into those things that you're that you're talking about, if we really give them a Krishna conscious environment, then they'll get tired of those things. They'll get tired of those things, and they'll understand what's really important in life. And I see that happening so many times. So we give them the best we have. But we can't, we're not the controllers. If we just give them the best we have, we have done our job. We have done our service and we should always be there for them in any situation. If they feel our love, our care waiting for them, even if they go way off, then we're facilitating the opportunity for them to come back and have realizations. And many of us grown-ups, we did some of that stuff. Radhesham Prabhu, did you ever do any of that stuff? <laughs> Huh? You never did. I actually, I was in a very strictly disciplined atmosphere at home. My, my, that's the way my father grew me up. So I like to also grow people up in the similar manner. <laughs> that's why you're a brahmachari. I became 12, my father said, no, we can't play with girls. You know, boys should play with boys, girls should play with girls. So that's how we were raised, Maharaj. We should try to raise all our children like that. But we have to be accommodating for those who are not avatars like you. <laughs> Goranga Prabhu, what about you? <laughs> your mother, your mother's a witness. I was not strict like Radhisham. <laughs> Please don't ask for that. <laughs> What was the last part I did not hear? When I was not as strict as Radhesham Prabhu, and I am saying, please don't ask details. <laughs> what if we do? <laughs> we won't ask details. So we see someone who was raised in a very strict environment and someone who was probably, parents wanted the same thing, but strayed off a little but have come to the conclusion of pure devotional service. In other words, we have to do what works. <coughs> Disciplined, atmosphere, giving the children the best possible environment is, is what every parent should do. And if a child is like you, then it's very easy. But if a child does go astray to enjoy other things in other ways, we can't just cut them off. 
We have to attract them back by being instruments of Krishna's love in whatever they do. It's not that one size fits everyone. And that's not only with children, that's with all devotees at all ages. That's the way Srila Prabhupada was. It is becoming very late and we should end. Srila Prabhupada Kijan. Thank you very much.